there's something very sad going on in our culture now where everybody is so proud of young people for caring about climate change in a way that can be quite condescending. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of the global ebook store Racked and Kobo. We have a regular procession of authors who visit the Kobo offices. And while they're here, I get a chance to learn a bit about their careers, creative process, and their reading and writing lives. And hopefully, you will too. Welcome to Kobo in Conversation. My guest today is Jonathan Safran Foer. Jonathan is an American novelist who exploded into the literary world with his first novel, Everything is Illuminated, in 2002, followed up with the equally acclaimed Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close in 2005, before switching to nonfiction for his book about food production and factory farming titled Eating Animals in 2009. His most recent novel, Here I Am, was published in 2016. As we do in Kobo Conversation, I'll be asking him about books that were significant to him when he was young, books that helped form his sense of himself as a writer, and the books he was reading when writing his most recent book. And along the way, we'll spend most of our time talking about this latest work, We Are the Weather, which brings him to our studio today. Jonathan, welcome to Kobo and Conversation. So nice to be here, thank you. I'm going to read part of the summary of the book that came from the helpful publicists who were pulling this interview uh, together. <laughs> Most books about the environmental crisis are densely academic, depressingly doom-laden, and crammed with impersonal statistics. We Are the Weather is different, accessible, immediate, and with a single clear solution that individual readers can put into practice right away. When you decided to tackle the topic of climate change, were you conscious about what you didn't want the book to be? I absolutely was, and I was responsive to my own reading experiences, and not only of books, but of articles, my viewing experiences of, you know, TV documentaries or news pieces about climate change. And what I found is it was very easy to move me, apparently. You know, I would read a couple pages of a book, watch a couple seconds of something on a screen and say, oh my God, this is horrible. Somebody's got to do something. But I never stayed moved, and I never was moved to action. And I think even worse, I was confusing the feeling of being moved for doing something, you know, as if simply saying, somebody's got to do something, was doing something. So with this book, it's not that I figured out some other way of talking about climate change. This is an exploration of my own responses and why it is that I could know as much as I knew scientifically and could care as much as I care and still do hardly anything at all. The book begins with an exploration of suicide notes and then the faulty nature of memory. It segues into voluntary blackouts and collective sacrifice in North America during World War II. And at a certain point, I realized as a reader that we were a few chapters in but hadn't specifically addressed the topic that the book was about. And then I turned a page and you actually say, I've gone 63 pages in without <laughs> talking about climate change. So what were you working up to in those first 62 pages? Well, a couple of things. One is part of the story that I'm trying to tell here isn't only about climate change, but about our own problems with not believing what we know or not acting on what we know. And I explored different historical precedents of that and the psychology of that and as a kind of setting of the table before getting to the thing that this the kind of knowledge that is the subject of this book and there was another reason that i withheld it for that long and in a way it's contained in that word i just used withheld i was going to be writing about sacrifices people would have to make you know some people might think of those sacrifices as the least that could possibly be asked of somebody in the context of climate change some people might look at them as very stark and upsetting but I wanted to earn a certain amount of goodwill from the reader, make clear that this is not the kind of book that was, you know, described by the publisher, dour, depressive, academic, but one that was accessible, one that wasn't patronizing, but conversational, one that didn't share conclusions, or not only conclusions, but also shared struggles. Something you work very hard to impress on the reader is that Climate change isn't coming. We're already in it. It's here and we aren't going to get out of it. 
Could you take a couple of minutes and just lay those facts out for us in terms of where we are now in current state of things? I'm not sure exactly what I can lay out that you wouldn't know on your own. And the, the funny thing about where we are with climate change right now is knowledge isn't the problem. You know, five years ago, it maybe was. And there was either, you know, a large proportion of people who didn't believe the science or people who didn't really believe the implications of the science. It's not the case anymore. Even in America, which is certainly behind Canada and behind much of the rest of the world in terms of climate consciousness, 91% uh, of Americans accept the science of climate change. Twice as many Americans believe in Bigfoot as deny the existence of climate change. We see the superstorms. We see the evidence. We see the um, wildfires in California. We see the burning of the Amazon, which I should say is not an effect of climate change, but a cause of climate change. We see climate migrations, you know, that seem to have played a role in the civil war in, in Syria. We've seen record temperatures. Uh, I was in Paris this summer and the hottest day on record in Paris. So there's ample evidence. One thing that is sort of newsworthy is this notion of a ticking clock and how much time we have to solve it. I don't know that people need proof that it's happening, but we might need proof that it matters that it's happening or that it matters that we solve it quickly. You know, when a climate scientist, you, you've probably heard people say, we have 10 years or we have 20 years or we have a certain amount of time. What they're referring to is before we enter into runaway climate change, which is when there will be positive feedback loops that will make it impossible to stop a process that's already in motion. The most common is called the albedo effect, which is basically things that are white or light in color reflect sunlight, things that are dark absorb it. Ice is white, water is dark. So as white ice melts, it becomes dark water, which absorbs more of the heat than the ice did, which warms the water, which makes, creates more melting, and it becomes a positive feedback loop. So you can tell me what you think. My impression, and a lot of it is anecdotal, from everyone I talk to, and I've gone to many different parts of the United States and different parts of the world, not just liberal audiences, conservative audiences, not just secular audiences, fundamentalist Christian audiences, not just urban audiences, but rural audiences, my impression is at this moment in history, there is a broad consensus and a broad awareness that we are facing a very big problem. And what very much comes through as the book is getting started and is gathering momentum is that that future is upon us, but it can be more or less severe depending on choices that we make right now assuming that those choices are made immediately and with urgency and and widely adopted and uh, and carried out. But you go on to speak about climate being such a difficult thing for people to get their heads around. I think you've described it as the most boring topic that to science has ever been asked to explain. So tell me why why that is. Why do we have so much difficulty holding these challenges in our minds? I mean, I think the reasons are different for each person, mm -hmm. but it seems to feel far away to most people and kind of vague. It's something that happens somewhere else. It doesn't really happen to us or it either happens geographically far away or will happen chronologically far away. And, you know, our kids, our grandkids, 50 years, 100 years, that's when it's going to be really awful. Um, not only the effects, but the causes. You know, the causes are these massive corporations somewhere. The causes are China halfway around the world. The causes are the fossil fuel industry, as opposed to recognizing, as you were suggesting with your earlier question, that the effects are here and now, and the causes are also here and now. Let's talk about that a bit, because a, a theme that recurs is how we almost prefer our own powerlessness and prefer to externalize both causes and solutions. Politicians aren't doing anything. Companies aren't doing enough. We can't stop using cars. We want to care and even despair while believing that there isn't anything we can do. And where does that impulse come from, do you think? Well, that's beautifully put. That's, that's a really nice way to, to say it. I think in part the impulse comes from laziness. Like, you know, if, if what it took to stop climate change was that we would never hit ourselves in the face anymore, we would have stopped climate change already. The problem is a lot of the things that we have to regulate, not stop doing, but just do with moderation, are really nice. Like flying is really nice. It's great to see other parts of the world, try other foods, meet other people. It's even ethically nice, you know, to have your perspective expanded and to realize that your way of looking at and doing things 
is only one way. There are many different ways. Eating meat for most people is really nice. It tastes good. It smells good. It's, you know, and we have most people have like wonderful psychological associations involving meat and memories of family meals or cultural associations. So we have a lot of incentives not to see our own culpability or to try to offload it, you know, onto corporations, onto leaders. If only the government would force us to be different, then we'd be different. The climate crisis, if you took an inventory of all of the things that bias us away from action towards apathy, it's kind of perfect in that way. Diffuse, long-term effects, no immediate feedback loops of gratification. And a way you describe it perfectly is if a, a cabal of evil psychologists decided to create a crisis that no one would respond to, they couldn't have done better than we've done with, with climate change. But you also talk about the power of story and about how stories kind of both initiate and reinforce action. And you bring up Claudette Colvin, the first person to move from the back of the bus to the front. Can you talk a bit about the role of story in this as you're trying to move people to action? Well, certain kinds of stories are memorable and other kinds aren't. Certain kinds of stories move us, either move us emotionally or, or move us to change, and other stories don't. And it's not a coincidence that so much of history is made of good stories and so many leaders are iconic. You know, Hitler and his mustache or Churchill and his cigar or Barack Obama and the name Barack. You know, he used to go by Barry before he became a politician. So the example that I gave Claudette Colvin was she came about nine months before Rosa Parks and fulfilled an almost identical action. But the NAACP decided that she might not be the best hero of the story, the best messenger, because she was from a um, quote unquote bad family, because she was pregnant with the child of a married person. She was um, not as presentable as Rosa Parks, who was extraordinarily savvy, intelligent, good spokesperson. It was already uh, actively involved in the NAACP. So with climate change, you know, it, it's, uh, it feels like such a diffuse problem. Like, all right, we've got wildfires, we've got melting ice sheets, we've got warming oceans, we've got climate refugees, we've got warm temperatures, but we've also got these weird polar vortexes. You know, it's hard to summarize that all into something that like a kid could draw. I think it's one of the reasons that Greta Thunberg has been so important is because she is the first climate hero you know, the first person where we can say, that's good, you know? We haven't been able to say, this is good, this is bad. So maybe you could say, like, the fossil fuel industry is bad, but nobody even really knows what they're talking about. Like, what is the fossil fuel? Are we talking about a chimney with smoke coming out of it? What, what do we mean? We want something that we can draw. We want something that we can name. And so with Greta Thunberg, we've had, we have this, this hero, and it's, in, in a way, like, proves this point that I'm trying to make. Like, you've seen how much energy now rallies around that hero. Storytelling also came up in Eating Animals and, um, and brackets that book uh, in a way. As a writer of fiction who is attempting to initiate change, are you grasping with and grappling with finding those stories that will initiate change? Well, I think that's true whether you're a nonfiction writer or a novelist or not a writer at all. Like, there's so many different ways to describe the same thing. Just imagine describing your feelings, like, to a partner or to a family member or friend. There are a lot of different ways to articulate the same feeling. Some are going to get a more receptive listener <laughs> than others. You know, if, let's say, you hadn't read my book and that that hurt my feelings, right? I could say to you, you know, it really pisses me off that you have time to read all these other books and interview all these other authors and you don't even bother to open the cover of mine. Or I could say, you know, I really respect you as a reader and I respect your taste and it would mean the world to me just to know what you think. I know you're a really busy guy, CEO of this big company. If you ever get the time, I would love to hear what you think. Like the second thing is going to make you a hell of a lot more likely, right? So the ways that we talk about the things that we care about determine what happens with them when they're out in the world or largely determine. We have a bad way of talking about climate change, both because 
it doesn't move us or doesn't move most of us. It, feel, it makes it feel far away rather than near. And also it, it alienates a lot of people. You know, It makes it seem like this is a political issue when it should not be a political issue. Conservatives don't care about the environment less than liberals do. They don't love their kids or grandkids any less than liberals do. But climate change, unfortunately, has become a bit of a zero-sum game where some people are going to score points and some people are going to lose points politically. Some people are going to feel smart and righteous. Other people are going to feel demeaned and ignorant. Um, we need to find a way to talk about it that reveals that, of course, we all want to save the planet. One thing that you illustrate so well is this experience I certainly have felt before that there are, there are some kinds of action that are easy to take, that feel rewarding, that validate you as you do them. And then there are ones that don't, that just feel quotidian and you know, without benefit or without reward. And that almost none of the rewarding actions are the ones that you need to do to, to slow down climate change. You describe this experience of racing home ahead of Hurricane Sandy. So can you, can you talk a bit about that push and pull for us of actions that reward, actions that don't, and how we need to overcome that in a way? Well, there's a danger in doing things that feel good rather than that do good. Some of it is just a problem of information. So like the most talked about actions um, with regard to the environment are recycling, avoiding plastic, and planting trees. And I would probably add to the list like buying a hybrid, although that wasn't in this specific study that I'm referencing. And those are not high impact activities. There are four activities that matter more than all others by a long shot. And they are flying less, living car free, or driving as little as possible, having fewer children, and eating a plant-based diet. So three of those are kind of in a bit of a group where you know most people just aren't in the process of deciding whether or not to have a kid in a given moment. 85% uh, of Americans drive to work and most Canadians as well live in cities that were designed to require cars. More than half the flights we take are either for business or for non-leisure personal purposes, like visiting a sick relative. So we need to do less of those three things, but we can't just say, hey, tomorrow, let's all, let's all stop. I'm shutting it all down. Yeah. Food is different because for two reasons. One, it's a decision we make three times a day and it's unconstrained for almost all of us. You know, we really can choose what we're going to eat. And it's the only one of those four that immediately addresses methane and nitrous oxide, which are two of the most powerful greenhouse gases. Methane is about 86 times as powerful as carbon. Nitrous oxide is about 310 times as powerful. When I say powerful, what I mean is, you know, think about greenhouse gases as forming something like a, a sheet, a blanket over the earth that holds in the heat. It keeps it from reflecting the sunlight from reflecting back into space. Methane is a, a blanket that's 86 times as thick as carbon and nitrous oxide is 310 times as thick. So as we're facing this ticking clock of needing to somehow stop this warming before we reach um, runaway climate change, we want to look at the biggest expenses first. You know, if you were like a, a family that has a budget, you're trying to pay the rent at the end of the month, the mortgage. It would be idiotic to say like, who bought these three postage stamps, you know, this month? Wiser is to say like, do we really need this car? Or like, boy, we spent all of this money on health care. Is there any way that we can... I know that's not a problem in Canada, but in the United States, health care is a huge expense. When you were getting this book going, when you were starting to gather thoughts around it, was this idea of diet being the thing that you can do now, the thing that is, in some ways, the most impactful sacrifice that a, that a person can make to address the climate crisis, was that the seed of the idea for the book and then the rest built around it? Or did you go into this as an exploration and found that in the middle? Very, very much the second. The last thing I wanted to do was write another book about meat, animal products. I really feel like I exhausted that subject with eating animals. I, I set out to write about my own problematic relationship to the question of, should we eat animals? With this book, I wanted to write about climate change. That's what was motivating me. That's what was upsetting me. That was the problem that I was seeking to solve. Like, what can I do? Somebody who 
believes in science. I believe what the scientists have to tell me. I'm somebody who loves my kids. I'm somebody who's thinking, who doesn't, well, who would rather be part of the solution than part of the problem? So what can I do? Both in the sense of what can I do that will matter in the world? And also in the sense of what are my own limits? What can I do? Like, it's bad to fly. We know this. It's not controversial. I flew here from New York this morning. Not flying here was outside of my limits of what I could do. So where do my, um, what I feel like are my obligations and what I feel like are my limitations? Where do those two things meet? Anybody who pays attention to climate science knows that meat is the most important decision that we make vis-a-vis the environment. One of the things that was really surprising to me, actually, um, as I've gone out on this book tour, you know, I, I spent a good amount of time in the book talking about how environmental groups haven't really talked about meat until very recently. Now they do. Al Gore never talked about meat. Going out on this book tour, I've met an awful lot of climate scientists and, you know, shared stages with them. Pretty much the last one, they're all vegetarians. And the ones who aren't vegetarians eat hardly any meat. Al Gore is a vegan. You know, these are things that people don't talk. These Greta, are things I did not know. Greta Thunberg's a vegan, as you probably, you might know that. They don't, they're not that public about it, but they are less willing than most of the rest of us to ignore the science, you know, given that they are the ones who are documenting the science. Well, and as you say, the, the science is conclusive, but there's also a lot of it and it's noisy. So as we hear about carbon footprints and cap and trade and you know, all of the other things that surround this, it's, it's easy to lose both the importance of methane and nitrous oxide sort of sitting in the middle of it as an accelerant and that particular prescription in the midst of all of the other ones that people are trying to push on at the same time. It's hard to go, oh, that's a thing I can do, which is one of the things that I think makes this book so interesting is that you do locate a solution that people could say, yeah, I could do that now. Absolutely. And I wish people with much, you know, larger voices than I have would do that. Your uh, voice is pretty large. You do okay. <laughs> it's large inside my, my house in Brooklyn, but outside of my house, you know, just speaking realistically and honestly, like a writer has limited reach. Like I do what I can with the reach that I have, but it's, it's very limited. And I would love to see, you know, real public figures with, you know, millions of followers and starting to talk about these things because I think an awful lot of people would follow, you know, really, I believe that. I don't, I don't think the problem is that people are lazy or ignorant or unwilling to make changes. I genuinely believe we're looking to change and don't know exactly what to do. And having trustworthy messengers tell us, hey, here's what we can do right now. I'm going to do it. Do it with me. We're going to be imperfect about it. Sometimes we'll fall short. We're not going to be judging each other. We're not going to measure our distance, distances from perfection. We're just going to try. There were a few facts that I highlighted as I was working my way through the book. If cows were a country, they would be the third largest country for carbon output after the U.S. and China. If in terms of relative footprints for countries, if the whole world consumed carbon the way that a person in Bangladesh consumes carbon the, or outputs carbon, the earth could be the size of Asia and sustain everyone equally. With China's uh, individual personal output, it was about right, but if everyone produced greenhouse gases the way that a North American did, we would need four Earths just to survive. And that sense of relative scale was something that I hadn't seen before, that the differences in terms of output, the differences in terms of consumption are so vast between this very carbon and greenhouse gas intensive lifestyle that we live in, in North America and in Europe versus what people in countries that were doing you know, with much less produce. And yet they're the ones that are going to feel the effects of this far more than we will. It's the great tragic irony of climate change is the people most responsible for it are the people who generally speaking will feel it less least and the people who are feeling it most acutely are the people who are least responsible for it it's a little bit i use an analogy in the book of it's as if we're smoking and somebody halfway around the world is getting lung cancer and we get to indulge this addiction of ours while maintaining perfect health your grandmother shows up throughout this book and she's obviously a person about whom you care deeply, but 
What is her role in a book about climate change? Well, you know, her role was the role that she had in my life. So I wrote this book in the year that she passed away. And the book is more than any book I've written, including novels, just a, a kind of record of my own thinking and feeling it during the time that I was writing it. And I decided to allow other parts of my life in because they were so strongly influencing what I was thinking about and feeling. And my grandmother's always been a kind of North Star for me or a compass maybe is a better example, a better analogy. And as I was thinking about climate change and witnessing her death, I was thinking about how she lived her life and the choices that she made, especially when they were different from the choices of other people around her, like when she decided to flee her village, you know, before the Nazis, as the Nazis were approaching, despite the fact that she didn't know any more than other people. Everybody knew, you know, there was no, there was no mystery or secret that the Nazis were coming. It's just everybody else thought it will be okay or it will be like various things that have happened in the past. Nobody else intuited the scale of the destruction that was to come. And for whatever reason, she did. And it, I don't know why. You know, it's not because she was smarter than them. It's not because she was braver. I don't know why. But as I was thinking about why it is that we know what we know and do so little, and at the same time experiencing her death, it just it made good sense to me. No, it's not even that it made sense. It's that what my brain naturally did was mm -hmm. to look to her life. You described the genesis of this book coming from your grandmother moving in with your parents towards the end of her life. What was it about that event in particular that triggered this uh, kind of this series of thoughts? I think in part it was witnessing my parents care for her and thinking about what it is to care and what our obligations are to others, whether they are nuclear family or people halfway around the world or people who aren't yet born yet. And I became, I kind of, I had a, a heightened sensitivity to the questions of just personal responsibility. You know, I was really moved, I have to say, by the way that my parents took her in and made sacrifices and you know, kind of I, turned their own lives inside out yeah. to help make that possible. Yeah. We live in a world or in a moment when acquisition is like the greatest value always having more, you know, acquiring, consuming, like we deserve to have everything when we want it. And that can't be sustained. I mean, we've, we've known that for a long time, but in a quite urgent way, it can't be sustained and witnessing somebody else being willing to have less in the interest of a greater good is really, ins it's just inspiring. And um, the way my parents took care of my grandmother was one, one such case of that. As you mentioned, you show a lot of different facets of yourself as you go through this book, yourself as a writer, as a grandson, as a son, as a father, talked about you a bit as a grandson in relation to your grandmother, but let's talk about how you look at climate change through the lens of being a parent and being a father. I don't think parents care more about climate change than people who aren't parents. Most of the, frankly, most of the most like energetic environmentalists I know aren't parents, but being a parent has, has affected the way that I think about it. It's made visible to me something that might otherwise have been an idea, you know, like I have witnesses from the future, you could say. You know, I, when I'm making various decisions, even something as seemingly simple as what should we do for winter break, you know, you know, looking at them, knowing that I will be taking the trip with them, it creates a reminder for me of the stakes of that decision. Kids, my kids have been really powerful witnesses for me, especially as this conversation, as they've gotten a little bit older, as the awareness of climate change among young people is now you know, it's what, it's what they talk about and think about. It's what they have strong feelings about. It's impossible not to share this with them, you know, both the sort of ideas and conversation, but also the lived experience of it. Like, we're going to try to do these things a little bit differently, and these are the reasons, and it shouldn't fall to them. There's something very sad going on in our culture now where everybody is so proud of young people for caring about climate change in a way that can be quite condescending and 
can also be a way of offloading responsibility. It's, it's like being proud of someone who's waving from a sinking ship. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like it's so it's so cool that you care as <laughs> as the ship that you are sinking. Yeah, yeah. Easily, the most compelling part of the book for me is a section that you called "Dispute with the Soul," and I hesitate to describe it, but maybe you can talk a little bit about that part of the book and what you were trying to do there. The book begins by um, talking about the oldest known suicide note which was written in ancient Egypt about 4,000 years ago, which was given the title by its first translator, Dispute with the Soul of One Who is Tired of Life. And I just kind of, I talk about ideas of suicide and ideas of survival throughout the book and the question of whether this, the author of the first suicide note even committed suicide. We, we don't know. We have, we have no idea. And a suicide note can also resemble a life note, like arguments for wanting to live and survive. In the chapter, that's an extended sort of dialogue with myself. There wasn't anything that I was really planning or intending. I thought it would be interesting, I guess, to see what would happen if I opened myself up or if I opened the form up to that kind of internal debate. I didn't do a lot of planning. I, I, it's pretty much dictation of an interior dialogue. I won't try to describe it, but in some ways, it's, it's all of the reasons why it's hard to do something about climate change combined with all of the reasons why it being hard isn't enough of a reason not to do something about climate change. But one idea from that section that, that resonated with me was that notion that you explore that rage and despair are guilty pleasures. Mm -hmm. And can you, can you talk a bit about that? Well, it feels good to hate Bolsonaro when you look at images of the Amazon burning. It feels good to be angry at Trump when, you know, he pulled us out of the, pulled America out of the Paris Climate Accords. And it can feel good in a way that's really counterproductive because that feeling can be mistaken for doing something. You know, the reality is I campaigned for Hillary. I certainly voted for Hillary. I wish Hillary had been president. If Hillary had been president, the U.S. would still be in the Paris Climate Accords. But like Canada and like every country in Europe, we wouldn't have met the goals. And I think there's a danger in feeling good about you know, your name being on the right line on the right document when the document doesn't mean anything, just as there's something bad about outsourcing all of your anger when in fact, it's really difficult and necessary to look in the mirror and say, you know, what is it that I am doing? We all seem to be waiting for somebody else. You know, America's waiting for China or India or Brazil individuals are waiting for corporations to suddenly do the right thing or we're waiting for the government to suddenly do the right thing we just don't have time for to indulge these emotions to wait we have to look in the mirror say what is it that i can do what's what are my limits and i would need to start right now this book is filled with i'm not sure rage frustration to be sure but also this feeling like you're pacing around the issue, either probing at it or trying to find a way that will connect with people, to tip people from knowing to acting. Is that sense that every chapter is a bit of an exploration of an idea, you, know, you working through different ways of trying to approach this problem? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this book, as I said before, it's, it's not like a, a conclusion that I reached that I wanted to share. It's a problem that I've been wrestling with and continue to wrestle with. I didn't, I didn't resolve it when I finished the book. You know, climate change is not an event, it's a process. And the people who say we're doomed or people who say we're gonna be all right are both wrong. We're not doomed and we're not gonna be all right. It's a process of loss and that loss, some of it has been determined already, almost all of it has not been determined but will be by what we choose to do. And our choosing to act is also a process, it's not an event. You know, we're not going to end this interview and say, awesome, let's both be environmentalists. And that's that. Probably what will happen is each of us will have been, you know, given that much more to think about and we'll go home and we'll have dinner in a few hours. You'll think about that. Well, I will be thinking about planning a couple trips later this year. I will have my own meals tomorrow. And even though I am a committed vegetarian, it's still not easy for me. I still think about it. I still crave eating all kinds of other foods that... Part of me wants to eat and part of me doesn't want to eat. And I think 
the way forward is to acknowledge that we have these competing parts. Part of me wants to fly, part of me doesn't want to fly. Part of me wants to drive, part of me doesn't want to drive. Part of me wants to eat meat, part of me doesn't want to eat meat. And not finding a way for one to defeat the other, but finding a way to do what needs to be done, you know, to moderate behavior, to regulate ourselves, to do less of the things that we have to do less of. In your writing of this book, you say, I was willing to trade comprehensiveness, even a kind of professionalism, for a form that motivated me. And was that just an outcome of the writing process, or did you know at the beginning that you, you weren't going to try and write the everyday kind of climate change book? I knew it at the beginning. I mean, I'm not qualified to, first of all. You know, I'm not a cli climate scientist, and I'm not a professional journalist. I don't have that informational background or technical background, and I don't have those skills. I bring something else to a book. I bring the skills that I have as a novelist, and I bring the honesty of my perspective. And that honesty was actually my guiding inspiration as I wrote the book, even when it was embarrassing or potentially even shaming. There's just, we don't need a kind of false self-righteousness or a false certainty or a false clarity. I feel an enormous amount of confusion about climate change and a lot of disappointment in myself. And I think sharing those is not only potentially helpful to other people who feel the same kind of mix of emotions, but helpful for me to as a way of moving forward and doing something. You wrote two works of fiction before switching over to nonfiction for eating animals, then two more works of fiction before coming back to We Are the Weather. Are those easy transitions for you? Are fiction and nonfiction works kind of progressing in parallel? Or do you, do you switch you know, mental tracks? I had a friend who was a writer who's unfortunately no longer alive who used to say, writing is like pulling teeth out of your penis. <laughs> it's like, there's just, nothing is easy. <laughs> nothing is effortless. It's just terrible. It's just terrible. And, uh, you know, is moving between fiction and nonfiction hard? Man, it's really hard. Is moving between fiction and fiction hard? Yeah, that's really hard. I find it all really quite hard. The saving grace is when I find a subject, or maybe the subject isn't the right word, like an atmosphere, maybe, that I care about. And when I care about what I'm writing about, I tend to do okay. And when I don't... In that it lowers the amount of suffering or the suffering is more bearable? It lowers the amount of suffering. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's not all suffering. A lot of it's just boredom. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is the feeling of lying to oneself. When I really care about what I'm writing about, either on the level of it simply pleasing me or the level of it feeling significant in some way, then I, I tend to do okay. But that usually, or for me, that so far has involved an awful lot of false starts. You know, nine tenths of the time working on things that I don't realize for quite a while that I don't care about in, in the right ways. Do a lot of things get thrown away or stuck oh, in the drawer? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, More than, more than two thirds get thrown away. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. What were some of the books that formed your sense of being a reader when you were young? So when I was very young, I would probably say Jewish stories, you know, that I was either told in Hebrew school or by my parents or grandparents, biblical stories. As I grew in high school, I liked a lot of the kind of, you know, beatniks and the kinds of things that high school students read and love for great reason. In college, I was interested in magical realism, Italo Calvino and Marquez and Borges. They really expanded my notion of intellectually and emotionally what fiction could do. Uh, I read Love in the Time of Cholera right around the time that I was writing my first book, Everything is Illuminated, and I think his influence is pretty obvious. Were there, were there other books that were formative to your sense of yourself as a writer? Many. Kafka's stories were hugely influential. Bruno Schultz, Philip Roth, but also things that weren't books. You know, I absorbed a lot of media when I was younger. My parents were pretty laissez-faire about how much TV we could watch and what TV we could watch and video games. 
my older brother and I just wasted enormous amounts of time. And as it turns out, it wasn't wasted. One of the, the things that I found really enjoyable about reading this book is its incredibly comprehensive bibliography. Mm. It is, it's a deeply read book from that perspective. Can you highlight some of those things that were important to you as you were working through these ideas in terms of source material? So in a way, there's two kinds of source material for this book. The kind that I sought for obvious reasons, like, all right, I need to know everything I can possibly know about runaway climate change or everything I can find out about the relative carbon footprints of different activities or even specifically different foods. I knew what I was seeking. I sought it. And there's so much climate science available right now that I always found it. You know, there are very few questions you could ask about the science of climate change that you can't find answers to with some ease. And then there were subjects that I didn't really know I was writing about. I was just digging around. And um, a lot of the first 60 pages that we talked about, it's meandering. You know, it goes from civil rights movement to hysterical strength to how bees ward off predatory hornets to um, contemporary pollination techniques to uh, you know, Noah's Ark. I was all over the place. In, that, in those cases, the source material was stuff that I was happily stumbling upon. Last question for me. You are an imaginative person by trade. Do you imagine the future right now? Do you locate yourself in a certain view of what's to come? Oh, that's a deep question. Um, do you? As I was going through this book, one of the things that struck me was I have two views of the future, and one is the disaster view, and one is the everything's going to be fine view. And as more of the book came on to me, you could see those two starting to converge, that you couldn't have a purely sunshine and everything's going to be all right version, and you could be more thoughtful and more deliberate about what that not ideal view of the future was going to look like. So it was like, you know, when your eyes diverge and then converge yeah. back together. And so it made me quite mindful of not really being deliberate about, okay, how do I think this is going to play out and what do I think I'm going to look like when I'm in it? Which is why I ask. Mm -hmm. You know, when I sign books for people, when I've signed this book, excuse me, I will very, you know, other books, I'll just say with thanks. With thanks, with thanks, with thanks, Jonathan. This one I've noticed, I found myself writing w with thanks and cautious hope. And I think that's where I, that's what I feel right now. You'd have to be out of touch with the science or stoned, basically, to, to just feel any kind of hope that isn't extremely cautious. I can imagine a world, let me put it this way. My kids are 10 and 13. We talk about climate change. There have been a few times in the last three months when I have come into the room where they're sitting and I said, you know what, guys, I think we're going to figure this out. I just think we're going to figure it out. I can tell you about one such time. It happened the other day. Well, one actually was when McDonald's announced they were going to start offering um, Beyond Burgers. I thought, you know what, if McDonald's is recognizing that we need to eat less meat, and not, by the way, because they're beneficent or want to be a part of the solution, but because individual choices compelled corporate change, which is at the very bottom of this book. Sometimes people say, why would we put the emphasis on individual choice when what we need is systemic change as if those two things were different? Um, we can bring about systemic change with individual choice and that systemic change will make it easier to make good individual choices and it will be a virtuous cycle. In any case, when McDonald's announced that, I said that to my kids. But more, uh, another example that happened even more recently was I have a friend named Samin Nosrat, who is a chef and a TV personality. She wrote a cookbook called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat and has a show on Netflix. I don't know of anybody in the world who does a better job at conveying what's great about food than she does. It's just so joyful. It's so informed by culture and friendship and family and love. She read this book and said that she's going to try to not eat animal products for breakfast and lunch. And when I read, she didn't even tell me that personally, I read it in an interview. The epicenter really of like the food world 
somebody whose life is food, but also has this irrepressible inner compass and cannot ignore science, you know? You know, when she said that, when I read, when I read the interview, when she said, I went down, I said to my kids, you know what? I think we're going to solve this problem. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Jonathan Safran Frohr's most recent book, We Are the Weather, and all of his other fantastic works are available at www.kobo.com. You can get links to the books mentioned in this episode and find previous episodes as well at www.kobo.com slash conversation. Be sure to give us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast source so people can find out how great this is and also check out our sibling podcast, Kobo Writing Life, all about the nuts and bolts of making it as an independent author. Thank you.